Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. In this episode of Blazor Train, we'll add to the scenario from last week's episode where we built an indexed DB repository that lets us access an indexed DB database on the local machine in a Blazor WebAssembly app. Indexed DB can be accessed even when offline, and that's great. But to me, using Indexed DB really shines when you can sync your online database to it, use it offline, and then when you come back online, sync the offline transactions to your online data store. Now, what I'm presenting here is a demo, not a product. It's a good start to a complex problem. I'll show you the architecture that we here at the AppV Next terminal have come up with to make this process as painless as possible. Synchronizing offline data is what's for dinner in the cafe car, and that's coming up right now, right here on Blaze the Train! So my Blazor repository demo is growing. If you take a look at GitHub slash Carl Franklin slash Blazor repository demo, that's where everything is. Now I've updated the readme to show all of the things that we're doing here. We're going to implement a server-side repository using a list in memory. Did that. Server-side repository using Entity Framework. Check. Dapper. Check. An API repository on the client side. Check. API controllers that that API repository calls, yes. We did a client-side repository to access indexed DB, even when offline. That was the last episode. And now we're implementing a version of the indexed DB repository that syncs data using an API repository when online. And finally, we're going to implement real-time data updates using a message broker, in this case, SignalR, to keep data in sync while the app is in use. Now another thing I've done is I've added some folders with code in certain states. So I've got a folder with the state of the code before we added IndexedDB last week, before we did the IndexedDB sync, and that's what we're going to start with today, and then also before we added SignalR to synchronize. Now, just to catch you up on where we are, if you go to Blazor Train and sort descending, I did many episodes on repositories and data access and all that, but it all came to a head with this. Queryable repositories, episode 76. So this is where we have a repository pattern that we can use on the client, we can use on the server. So I bundled up all that repository code, and I put it in a NuGet package called AVN Repository, and that's what my repo is using. Today we're going to start with this guy, before indexed DB sync. So this is where we left off last week. So to backtrack a little bit, we have a Blazor WebAssembly solution that's a hosted WebAssembly solution. So we've got a server, we've got a WASM client, and we've got a shared project where the models go. Under services in the client, we have our API repository that we use to access the controllers. We have a customer repository, which uses the API repository to access the customer controller. And there are three different customer controllers that we can use. One for in-memory, one for entity framework, and one using Dapper. Then last week we introduced this indexed DB repository. It's on the client and it talks to indexed DB. And none of the code in the app changed. We just swapped out the repository and now we're talking to indexed DB. We also created from that one specific to the customers table. So the first goal of today is to create a version of this indexed DB repository that knows when it's online and when it's offline. And when it's online, it's going to use an API repository to access the controllers. But when it's offline, we're going to be able to use a synchronized version of the indexed DB using the indexed DB repository 
and we're going to keep a list of transactions, inserts, updates, deletes, delete all. And then when we come back online, the idea is to synchronize, to play those transactions back and get ourselves back in the right state. So this seemingly simple feature introduces a lot more complexity to the application and a bit more overhead. In order for the app to truly work offline, we have to get all records from each table we want to access when we're offline. That means when you run the app for the first time and you're online, you'll need to download all that data. Now, our demo just goes ahead and does this without any fanfare because the customer's table is so small. But in the real world, you may want to tell your user to please wait while you download all the data, you know, show them a progress bar, that kind of thing. So the first thing we're going to do today is create an online offline indicator. Now this is going to be a user interface element, so it'll be a razor component. And the idea is we're going to use JavaScript to use the navigator.online status and have the JavaScript code notify the Blazor app when the status changes. So in the client under shared, we're going to add a new razor component and it's going to be called connectivity indicator razor. So here we're injecting the IJS runtime and what we've got are two render fragments, one that we show when we're online and one that we show when we're offline. Now we're going to initialize by calling JavaScript. The method will be connectivity.initialize. And we're also going to dispose of it when this component is disposed. The heart of it is here, a JS invocable connectivity changed method where we just pass the Boolean whether we're online. So now we need some JavaScript. Under the web root in the client, I'm going to create a new folder called JS, and I'm going to add a JavaScript file called connectivity.js. Now this is important. Let me move this up here so you can see. I want to open the properties of our new JavaScript file, and I want to change this property right here, copy to output directory from do not copy to copy if newer. Now you got to do this for any resource that you add on the web or the client side in a Blazor app, right? Now I know I could have just skipped over that because you guys are experts, but it goes without saying, somebody out there is going to get very frustrated when it doesn't work. All right, now let's tell our application that we need this JavaScript file and where it is. So I'm going to go to index.html in the web root, and I'm going to add this script tag right here. Make sure you get the right path. It's in the JS folder. Now, where are we going to put this connectivity indicator? Well, I think a good place for this demo is in the main layout, right here in the top row. Now, this is referring to a couple of images, and these are in the repo. So let's add them. First, we'll add an images folder to the web root. Then I'm going to download these PNG files from the repo copy them in there and set their copy to output directory property to copy if newer. So now let's run it and see if we can at least tell whether we're online and offline. All right, there's a big old green Wi-Fi symbol right there. So let's simulate being offline. I'm going to press F12 to bring up the internet tools. And when I go to the network tab, you can see it's already remembered that I was offline when I opened the tools. So right there, you can select no throttling, which means you're online or offline to simulate being offline. Boom. Boom. Okay. It's a good start. Now we're going to duplicate some code. Down in the services, we're going to make a copy of indexed DB repository but we're going to call it indexed DB sync repository. Now we're going to do the same thing with the customer indexed DB repository. I'm actually just going to copy all the new code in here and then I'll explain it. We're injecting an API repository of T entity, right? That's our API repository that we're going to need. We're injecting the JS runtime. These other things were injected before, but these are the new ones. 
We've got a Boolean property is online that we can read and set. We're going to raise an event to the caller called online status changed. And that's going to need this online status event args. So let's add that. This is just based on event args and we add the is online property. Okay, now continuing on down here, after we set our injected objects, we've got this new thing called a key store name. What's a key store? If you take a look at program, we've only defined one table here, the customer table, but we're gonna add another table that links up offline keys to online keys. Online keys are the primary keys or the ID properties that are in the database. But when you're using IndexedDB, those are completely different. And so when we go to synchronize, we're going to need to know what those pairs are. We want to be able to look up one if we have the other. So we're going to use a convention. The key store name is going to be the store name, but we're also going to append this suffix. And we're going to use a class called globals for that. So let's make globals CS now. Not only do we have a keys suffix, we also have a local transactions suffix. Because yes, we're going to need to store those transactions when we're offline in another table. So we're adding two tables to our indexed DB. Let's keep going. So our key store name is the store name with the global key suffix after it. Right here is where I'm initializing the JS runtime. Connectivity initialize. Just like we did in the connectivity indicator component. Now for the local store name, I'm using the global's local transaction suffix after the store name. But I did this two different ways. It's really up to you how you want to use it. Now in connectivity changes, we're going to change our is online boolean to whatever the state is. And if we're offline, we're going to tell the user, we're going to raise this event telling the user that we're not online. Otherwise, before we tell the user that we are online, we're going to synchronize. We're going to sync our local database to the server, which we'll get to. So in our methods like delete all, delete all async, we're always going to update the offline repository, even when we're online, to keep it in sync. So and that's going to be true for all of these. All right, here's our next thing that we need, this local transaction types. Because this method right here is going to record, and I'm sorry about the language, it's a little confusing, record and record. This is a verb, record, delete, all, async, meaning record it in the transactions table. Now we only want to do this if we're not online. If we are online, we don't need to put a transaction in the transactions table. So we're just bailing. But we're going to need these local transaction types. Let's add that before we do anything else. So here we go. It's an enum, insert zero, update one, delete two, delete all three. Now we need another class called a local transaction which is something that we're going to record in the store. So let's add local transaction. So this is what we're going to store every time we're offline and we do an action, insert, update, delete, delete all. We're going to store the entity. We need to specify the action, the transaction type, which is just nice to have if you want to display it in the UI, and the ID, which we have as an object. This is a good time to mention that this works really well when you have a primary key that's generated and it's an int. I haven't tested it with other types of tables with other types of primary keys. Hey, maybe you'd like to do a pull request. That'd be awesome. Okay, back to our repository. We're cleaning up the red here. Delete by ID offline async. So this is deleting from the offline database. That means this ID is an offline or a local ID. 
we're going to call record delete by async first before we actually delete it. <laughs> okay, that's good. Good to know because we need the primary keys and all that. Then we call delete record async with the manager, which is for index DB. And if we're online, we want to delete any key map or any record of those key maps between the local ID and the online ID. We haven't really talked about what those are yet. It's actually a class called online offline key. I'll add that now. So we've got an ID that's an int, and that's okay because this is our class that we're going to use with IndexedDB. And then I have two objects, one for online ID, one for local. Now these will be ints in our case, but they could be other things. As I said, I haven't really tested it. One thing that I do know is that they're going to be stored in IndexedDB in a serialized format. So even though it looks right in the browser tools, when you load it, you're going to get a JSON object. So we got to do a little bit of deserialization when we read these things out. Take a look at this method here, get keys. So we're creating a list of online offline keys to return. We're pulling up from the key store name all of the records in there. And then we're getting the online ID and the local ID. But before we return them, we deserialize them using the two string value into an object. Just something that you have to do. Now I also have these two methods, get local ID and get online ID. If you have one, you can get the other. All right, so let's look at insert. Insert async. If we're online, we're going to call the API repository, insert async. We're going to get that return value, which has the primary key in it. And I'm going to call insert offline async with the entity that came back from our repository. And if we're not online, we're just going to call insert offline async. Now insert offline async assumes that this entity has an online ID. So what we're doing is pulling out that value online ID and we're creating a new record to store. Now just like before, we add the record, we get all the offline items and the last one is the one that we just added. So we're getting the local ID from that item. And now we're going to create a new online offline key using the online and local ID. And then we're creating a new store record for the online offline key, making sure that the store name for IndexedDB is the key store and then the record. And then we're going to record a transaction that we actually inserted a record. Now remember, these record methods, if we go there and we're online, we just bail. But if we're not online, we create a new transaction and store that in the transactions table. So here's my update async. So if we're online, we're going to call update async and we're going to get the return value. And then I'm going to call this method update key to local. Update key to local does what you think it does. This entity has an online ID and we want to change it to a local ID, and that's what this does. So when we do that, we get back the entity with the local ID, and then we call update offline async. And what does that look like? We get the primary key of the entity, which at this point will be the local ID, and we're going to update the record in the local database with update record. And then we're going to record, not record, we're going to record that we updated it. So if we're offline, we're bailing. Otherwise, we're setting the action to update in creating a new local transaction that we updated this entity, and there it is. All right, now let's talk about sync. Sync local to server. Remember way back at the top when we had a change in connectivity, we were calling sync local to server when we come online from being offline. So here we go. We're getting all the transactions. And if we have transactions, we're going to go through them. I have this in a try catch. 
because, you know, errors happen during development. If the transaction is an insert, we call insert async using local transaction entity. We don't really care what the primary key is because it's auto-generated on the server. Again, another assumption. We're going to update the keys table by getting the local ID and the online ID because when we're offline, we don't have an online offline key record, right? So we have to create one. We're going to add that to the online offline key store. If it's an update, we're going to update that key from local because this is a local version, right? Passing the entity, getting back the entity with the key that is the online key. And then we're going to call update async with that entity. So this one has the online ID. Then for delete, it's the same idea. We update the key from local. You get the online ID and we delete. I think these are unnecessary because we're not using them anymore. But you know what? I'll keep them as is anyway. Delete all, we're going to call delete all async. Be very careful. And then we're going to call delete all transactions async, which clears out the transactions table. Manager clear table async local store name. Now let's update our schema for IndexedDB in program CS. I'm going to add my two new tables. Here's customer transactions, and here's customer keys. I'm going to add a customer index DB sync repository to my services. Now, here's a tip. Because I ran this before with one schema, and I've added tables to it, there's a possibility when I run this that the browser isn't going to know anything about these new schemas. And it's not something that you can just clear out with a cache because it's based on the URL, which includes the page name and all that. So here's a really simple workaround. In the server project, go to Properties, Launch Settings, and these guys right here, just change the numbers. I'll just bump it up to 7053 and 5053. Now to support offline syncing, our index razor page needs to handle the online status changed event, which will render it incompatible with the other repositories. So rather than do that, we're going to create a new page for the sync demo. So the sync demo injects the customer index DB sync repository, and it also injects iDisposable because we need to handle events. So in uninitialized async, I'm going to handle the online status changed event with this method right here. Now I wanted to put very little burden on the coder who's using this repository, but this unfortunately is one thing. We need to know whether we're online or not and when it changes because because I need to load the data if we go offline from the offline database. Now I also have this initialized boolean and I set it to true only after the first time when we're online. So right away, when we run this app, this will fire and is online will be true. So I don't want to reload it the first time because I've already reloaded. So essentially what we're doing is just setting initialize to true and then the second time we go from offline to online, that's when we're going to reload from the API. Follow me? And then the dispose just unhooks the online status event change. That's really the only difference in this demo. All right, going back to index, we now need to put a button up here so we can navigate easily to the sync demo page. So that's it. I just have a button that says go to offline sync demo. And I just navigate to sync demo. That's it. All right, let's run it. All right, so I'm going to go to my offline sync demo. And you can see I've got some notes here of the things that it does. But let's not look at what you see here because we're online. Let's look at the database, the IndexedDB database. So you can see in the customers table, let me expand this a little bit. We've got four records, but we have two IDs for each one. You can see we've got an outer ID and an inner ID. 
The inner ID is part of the record, so the entity, email, ID, and name, and that represents the online ID, one, two, three, four. But index DB also has its own ID for this record, and these are auto-generated as well. So that's why we need the customer keys table to keep track of this relationship. Let's take a look at that. So here you can see, and you can ignore this ID, but we really want this one, the local ID and the online ID for each record. So this is a way that we can keep track of and map the IDs. So when it comes time to sync, we can get the right one, right? Now the next thing is customer transactions. There's nothing in that because we haven't gone offline and done anything yet. So let's do that now. Go offline. Let's go back to our application here. I'm going to add a customer. You know, I said that I didn't have anything new in Sync Demo. I lied. I added a button to add a customer. Now I'm going to update Isadora. Watch right here. I'm going to delete Rocky. I'm going to delete Hugh. And we're left with Isadora, Jenny, and a new customer. If I refresh the transactions table, you can see I have four transactions. I have an insert for the new customer. I've got an update for Isadora, and I got a delete for Rocky and a delete for Hugh. The entities have the local key in them, right? But it doesn't matter because we're going to pull out the online key when we sync. So let's sync, and all we have to do to sync is go back online. Watch. Boom. Now we're back to our local IDs. There should be no transactions. Customer table now has only three, and customer keys now has only three. So there you go. That's a good start, and that's why I called this part one. Part two, next week, we will add signal R to this. So when two people are using it, and one of the records gets updated, we can update our local DB and refresh our data from the server. Now back to you in the studio, Carl. Now, yes, there are already solutions that use SQLite in WebAssembly and then use the browser cache to persist data between sessions. It works, and that's great. My approach is based on the repository code that I've already created. It was my intention to bypass SQLite altogether. If that's not your thing, no harm, no foul. But it works for me. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train!